Thank you, Michael, and I'm very, very excited to be here as we're coming to the conclusion of this great day. And what Matthew and I are going to do is to uh, offer a combination of two things. Matthew first is going to talk about the vision, the crucial vision we have to take what we have as Catholic men, to take what we have here on this great day, this rediscovery, and how to take it to many, many other men. I am honored to be on the same stage with Matthew Christoph, and as you'll hear from him, he has a passion, he has a vision to get out of our little cocoons, our little shells, our little groups, and to really shake up this world, and in particular, to shake up Catholic men for Jesus Christ. And following this, I'll come up and offer a few final words about how we make and keep the resolutions that God has given us today. Please join me in welcoming one of the finest Catholic men in our archdiocese who has done a great work on behalf of God's people, Mr. Matthew Christoph. I can't help but think he's talking about somebody else. Uh, my, my Catholic brothers, it's a great joy to be with so many committed Catholic men and to be here on this great day of joy and hope for Archdiocese. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to give you a big, brief background on some of the extensive research I've been engaged in in terms of the state of Catholic men in the church. Second, we're going to talk about the spiritual battle that cur we're currently in with Satan and sin and why, despite everything that you're going to hear about that battle, why our hope can be sure in Jesus Christ. And then third, I'm going to describe the fact that there's a severe man crisis in the Catholic Church why that man crisis exists, and I'm gonna to attempt to make the case of the things that we need to do to take action and to build resolute action in Catholic men. First, for background. I've been married to my childhood sweetheart for 35 years, Tamara. I have four grown children, three of them are married. I have two grandchildren and one on the way. About a decade ago, in the middle of a very consuming and rewarding professional career, I was diagnosed with cancer. After a fairly brutal battle, by God's grace, I was cancer-free, but I was left with ongoing health challenges that are significant. As I faced death, God allowed me to feel his presence and his voice. My brothers, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. God is real, and God loves you. In time, and not without some pretty significant resistance on my part, our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear that he is the almighty king and that I was to become a Catholic. And I was accepted in the church in 2006. Now, frankly, I was a rebellious pagan, a new ager. Sounds funny to me now. So in fact, I'm the fact that I'm standing here in front of you today, I think, gives a testimony to the power of Jesus Christ, the almighty king. As a convert, I've been encouraged and I've been mentored all along the way by a number of very committed Catholic men. Men who, as Scott Hahn talks about, have that ability and willingness to be friends. They're men who call me a brother, and they mean it. I begin to realize that many of our Catholic brothers don't realize what a great blessing it is to be Catholic men. And many Catholic men today take their faith for granted. This troubled me. My career was as a professional problem solver, and so I began to think deeply, or at least as deeply as I'm able, uh, about this Catholic man situation. Five years ago, a group of men and priests had the chance to meet with Bishop Lee Pichet, and we asked him, why are men so casual in their faith? His Excellency didn't miss a beat. He said, casual Catholic men don't know Jesus Christ. Of course, His Excellency is right, for many Catholic men, Jesus is abstract. He's conceptual, he's a historical figure. In fact, he's highly feminized so often. He's counterfeit Jesus, a Jesus that's just only all meek and mild, and is often portrayed to look like a lady with a beard. Men are not gonna follow a lady with a beard. Most Catholic men, many Catholic men, I think almost 
All these Catholic men that are casual in their faith, they don't understand. Jesus is the almighty king who leads an army of angels, who battles Satan and defeats him, who admonishes the Pharisees, who clears the temple, who's faced with constant threats of death, who talked tough about salvation and the call to perfection. But sadly, that Jesus, the true Jesus, is someone many men don't know today. So under the guidance of Bishop Bechet, we, we, a group of us said, well, we'll try to do something about this, this crisis of men not knowing Jesus. And we started this thing called Catholic Man Night. Archbishop Neinstead, Bishop Cousins, Father Bear, many priests have been active in this across the archdiocese. Catholic Man Night's a pretty simple idea. It's modeled after Acts 2.42, the early apostles, what they did to, to, to build the church. It's simple, we gather Catholic men together in uh, adoration and confession, we have a man feast, and we learn about Jesus Christ. So far, there have been 75 of these events across the archdiocese. Thousands of men have entered into Eucharistic adoration and confession and uh, Catholic brotherhood. There's also a Spanish language version called Noche de Ambres Catalicos, and hundreds of men are attending these. There's really good news of things happening in our parish. There's reason for, or in our archdiocese, there's reason for hope. You can learn more about that, and we're trying to find men, cour courageous men, that are willing to sponsor these in their parishes. They're free, they can be done easily. You can go to catholicmannight.com and learn more about that. Last year, I launched something called the New Evangelization Project to better understand this Catholic man crisis and to figure out what to do about it. I've assembled research data, and I've interviewed dozens of Catholic evangelists across the country, including bishops and priests and deacons and many Catholic laymen who are active. And the bottom line, here's what I found. If we wish to have a new evangelization, and we're hearing a lot about that, the new evangelization, there must be a new evangelization, creating generations of Catholic men who are absolutely on fire for Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. Now let's turn to the second topic I mentioned, the spiritual battle. We're in a uh, conference here that's focused on hope. So as I talk about this spiritual battle, don't lose hope. But we need to be realistic about what we're up against, men. Satan is on the march. He's picking off our brothers right and left, especially our young men. The modern culture, and even many in our church, try to downplay sin and they try to pretend like Satan is some kind of symbolic, archaic idea, you know, made up sometime a long time ago to describe bad tendencies in men. That's not what Jesus says. It's true that if Jesus is it's true that Jesus is the divine king, then it's also true that Jesus believes that Satan and tell, teaches us that Satan is real and he's active. And hell is real. Why do we say this? Well, we know that Jesus personally interacts and defeats Satan. Jesus casts out Satan's minions, devils, and even publicly talks to them and rebukes them. Jesus doesn't make mistakes. Jesus emphatically warns men about Satan. And so does every uh, apostle and every pope for the last 2,000 years. Satan is real, Satan is evil, and Satan wants your soul. He not only wants your soul, he wants the souls of your women, your children. Do you doubt that Satan is waging a war against men and in the world? It's the evil grin of Satan who's behind the beheading of Christians in the Holy Land. It's Satan's claws. They're behind the murder of millions of child, children in their mother's wombs. It's Satan's evil heart that's behind these so-called black masses. And it's Satan's eyes that are behind the extreme perversion of pornography that is flooded into our homes and is perverting the minds of men. Perhaps every single man in this room has been scarred to some degree by pornography. Some men are right now mortally wounded and must be miraculously healed by confession or they will die. We must go to confession. Hell is real and it has plenty of room. And Satan has a man plan. He is working overtime to corrupt men. 
especially our young men. Why is so, Satan so focused on men? Because he knows if he gets the men, he can, get, he can destroy the family, and he gets the wives and the children. We, despite all this, we must never forget that Jesus is real, and any idea that we might have about heaven doesn't compare to the greatness of heaven. Because our lives, the lives of our wives and our girlfriends and our families and our daughters and sons hang in the balance, we must take Satan as a real threat and deal with him. Now let's go to part three. As a result of Satan's very effective man plan, there's a serious man crisis in the Catholic Church. Let's dig into some numbers. 10% of American men are Catholic quitters. One in 10 men were baptized Catholic but have left the church. What does this mean? It means that one in three baptized Catholic men have left the church. Now this is a disaster, a disaster that's partly hidden because there's been a large number of Hispanic men who've come to our country who are Catholic. If the church had been highly effective in the last 30 or 40 years at evangelizing men, we wouldn't be holding our own. We'd be growing and we'd be much bigger. There has been an epic failure to evangelize men and we just must simply face that fact. So why do men leave? The single biggest reason, they just drift away. That's the number one reason. Certainly there are other reasons. Divorce, the rejection of church doctrines on hard topics like contraception and homosexuality. And there's clearly some, some men who've left out of righteous anger uh, for uh, the scourge of pedophile priests. But now let's turn to the men that remain Catholic. For this discussion, we can, we can break them into three groups. There are casual Catholic men, there are practicing Catholic men, and there are committed Catholic men. Casual Catholic men make up 50 to 60% of Catholic men. The majority, in fact, of Catholic men are casual in their faith. Now this word casual I've chosen very quick, uh, 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 on purpose. It means both by chance and it implies a lack of commitment and both of those things are, are evident in, in casual Catholic men. They're not passionate about being Catholic. They don't know the faith and they don't practice the faith. Here's some key stats. Six out of 10 Catholic men are not strongly proud to be Catholic. Six out of 10. 63% of Catholic men don't feel strongly that daily prayer is important and they don't pray. Two thirds of Catholic men do not attend mass on a weekly basis, two thirds of men. And four out of 10 attend mass a few times a year or seldom or never. Five out of 10 Catholic men think that mass is boring and that they don't get anything out of the mass. So if we wonder why men aren't going to mass, they don't understand the mass because you can't be bored in mass if you know what's going on. 87% of Catholic men do not have a regular practice of confession. That's almost nine out of 10. And here's a stat that's stunning. Only one in 50 men go to confession at least monthly, one in 50. Large numbers of Catholic men are engaged in pornography. Uh, recent studies show that 60 to 70% of adult men are looking at pornography on a monthly basis and sadly the numbers are much higher for young men. And casual Catholic men are not active in their parish. 90% uh, of men don't do anything in their parish outside of going to mass. Casual Catholic men are not committed to pass the faith on to their kids and less than 50% of them feel strongly that's even important for their children to be Catholic. Many Catholic, uh, casual Catholic men either don't care or they foolishly think that they can outsource the teaching of their faith uh, to their wives or to women in the parish, but they're wrong. It's the strength of the father's faith that is the single biggest predictor of the faith of the child. If a dad is casual and doesn't practice his faith and doesn't profess his faith, chances are the child is not gonna grow up to in, and be a Catholic when they're uh, in adult, an adult. Many casual Catholic men are probably, could be, just early stage quitters. This high percentage of casual Catholic men in the church is a major problem. We've got to come to grips with it. Now let's turn to the next group, practicing Catholic men. They make up 30 to 40% of Catholics. They, they attend faith, they know the base, uh, they attend mass, they know the basics of the faith. Uh, they pray on a pretty regular basis. However, most practicing Catholic men also don't go to confession. You've already heard those statistics. 
They do show up for some parish events, but most of them don't. And despite being practicing Catholic men, many of them, for example, wouldn't get caught dead praying in public, say at a restaurant, something simple like that. Most practicing Catholic men aren't catechized to the point of conviction where they're willing to step up and evangelize other men and their children. Perhaps, as Scott Hahn was talking about, that many have not had that conversion experience uh, of meeting Jesus and making a commitment to give their whole life to Jesus. Now let's talk about that last group, the committed Catholic men. They make up about 10% of our brothers in Christ. Uh, they attend Mass regularly. They, 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 many of them are weak, uh, daily attenders. They keep the Sabbath. They go to confession regularly. They're the ones that our priests can turn to and depend upon. Committed Catholic men are spiritual leaders in their families. They take the role of priest, prophet, and king seriously. They're engaged in the faith life of their wives and their children and their family. They have real friendships, deep friendships, with other committed Catholic men. And they have a deep and abiding peace that only can come from our Lord Jesus Christ. And they actively seek to draw other men to Christ and his church. They evangelize. They evangelize. That's what makes them committed Catholic men. Now, we can't talk about the man crisis without talking about other men in the church, and that's our bishops, our priests, and our deacons. And to be clear, some men love to criticize our clergy. I'm not one of those men, but it is important to talk about this clearly so that we can, can understand it. Vis Satan is viciously attacking and intimidating our bishops and our priests. The culture is in becoming increasingly perverted and hates the church because the church takes courageous, manly stands on topics. They have a, these priests and our bishops have a great number of responsibilities, and they're overwhelmed, frankly. I mean, they're stretched thin. But at the same time, many of our bishops and our priests have not come to grips with this Catholic man crisis, and they've not yet made the evangelization of men a specific priority. There's been little or nothing out of the Vatican or the United States Council of Catholic Bishops on this man crisis and the role of the modern man in the Catholic Church. We need this. There's a lack of commi a commitment so far to take action on the fact that men are different and they require a targeted and specific man-focused evangelization effort. As part of the new evangelization project, we've just fielded an extensive national survey that's asked laymen to describe the kinds of things that they need their priests to be doing in terms of evangelization catechesis. Now, just in five days, 1,300 men have filled out this rather ponderous survey. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy about it. Uh, and, and what are we finding? I'll tell you a couple things. First of all, when a priest makes a committed effort to evangelize men, guess what happens? Men pray more. Men go to confession more. They have more and deeper friendships with other Catholic men. Priests who are committed to men make committed Catholic men. It sounds obvious. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. And from this survey, what we're seeing is large numbers of priests haven't yet uh, made that commitment to evangelize men. And what you find when you look at those men they pray less, they go to Mass less, they go to confession less, and they're lonely. They don't have friends. They don't have deep, deep, abiding relationships. And the laymen that have filled out this national evangelization survey uh, also has some feedback to our bishops. Nine out of ten of these men are crying, asking for more effort to focus on the evangelization of men. To address this Catholic man crisis, our bishops and our priests are going to need to recognize it and step up. But my brothers, don't, let, don't even start to think that that somehow lets us off the hook, us laymen. Because if we are really going to get serious about evangelization, our priests need our friendship, they need our support, and most of all, they need us to man up and step up and start to evangelize the men in our parish. We don't have to go out and the street corner and pick somebody off we don't know. We have men around us in the pews who we can reach out to and invite to um, these evangelization efforts that we need to be starting that are focused on men. In closing, we are in a life and death struggle with uh, a battle with Satan. And we need to raise awareness around this man crisis. In spite of the dire outlook you've heard a little bit of today, we should never 
forget that in Jesus Christ we have total hope. Jesus has won the game. And the time's still on the clock, and we still need to uh, be doing our part. If we wish to have a new evangelization, there must be a new evangelization. An evangelization that's not satisfied to have casual Catholic men and practicing Catholic men, but that seeks to draw all men into a deep and committed relationship with Jesus and with each other. My brothers, each of us are going to stand alone in the final judgment with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our church teaches. And he'll say to us, perhaps, this is what I imagine he'll say to me, you know, Christoph, the last thing I told you was to go and make disciples. Now, show me your disciples. I think he'll ask that of all of us. And what are we gonna say? You can learn more about Catholic Man Night at catholicmannight.com and the new evangelization at a new evangelization newemangelization.com. And now Father Bear is going to take us from this point and help us understand the kinds of things that committed Catholic men need to do. Thank you very much. Well, here we are at the end of a long day of excellent speakers. So I thought to myself, how am I going to offer anything distinctive after all these terrific talks? And I thought, what I will do is I will offer a strikingly boring talk. <laughs> and when you go home and people say, how was it? They'll say, oh, there were lots of tremendous, very fine talks. And then uh, Father Bear gave a boring one. Now, the best way to give a boring talk is to have a boring word that actually causes yawning as it's spoken. Watch, watch what happens. I wish to say a few words about stability. Oh, come on, let it just roll off your tongue. Stability. And I have a little clock up here that says that I have 17 minutes and 17 seconds left. Greater than any hypnotist, watch the magic I can perform in 17 minutes. But I'm giving this talk, and I'm not ashamed to give this talk, because I have attended countless events like this today. I have heard marvelous talks over the years, and nothing happens. And so I'm tired of that approach. And I want to talk about an approach that has worked before there were ever big fancy conferences like this, all the excitement. And for some of us, these few words, I hope, remind you of some people you've known in your life. It might be your parents, grandparents, I want to talk about the fact that stability is the key to any lasting good any of us men can ever hope to have. And I say this and I say this again, and people fall asleep and they fall asleep again, but every once in a while someone comes back to say, you were right. Let's cut to the chase. This afternoon, we have this talk, we have a break, we have the mass, you go home. Many of you going home to wives and families. I hope tonight you have a perfectly boring evening. In fact, I order you to have one. 
I want you to do exactly what you did last Saturday night, if at all possible. If fresh opportunities, new things are offered to you tonight, take a big deep breath and yawn and say, honey, let's do exactly what we did last Saturday. Isn't that powerful spiritual advice? Doesn't that just stir your depth of heart? And I'm not afraid of saying it because what I am convinced has happened to so many men, including husbands and fathers, men of every age, is we have been deceived into thinking that when things are really cranking in our spiritual lives, there will be lots of change, lots of new stuff, no two days alike. One of the great old priests of our archdiocese, Father Frank Kiddock, I hope there's some people here from St. Charles Borromeo, he was pastor there for quite a long time. He would come to the seminary when I was rector and wow, here we have the great da -da -da -da, Father Frank Kiddock, and he'd say to these young men, go to bed at the same time every night and get up at the same time every morning and eat at the same time every day. He said he had those nuns years ago at Nazareth Hall who prepared the meals for the seminary. And those nuns could spot the healthy, strong vocations the old nuns would say to Father Kiddock, watch carefully to those who sleep well, to those who eat well, to those who laugh well. And they were right. We live in an age of extraordinary instability, and every one of us has gotten used to a kind of an addiction. Something new, something changed, something different. Let's go, let's go. And when we get religious, we just bring it right on into our religious sensibilities. The Carmelites, I love the Carmelites. I am not a Carmelite, but I have an extraordinary respect for the lay Carmelites. They wrap up their spiritual life in three simple ways. Something that must be done every day, something must be done every month, and something every year. And I wish to start with the thing that's done every month. Today is October the 4th, the beginning of a new month, a great time to go to confession. I saw many people attending confession today. Now, you go to confession at the beginning of October, and I hope your priest has given you some direction at the very least, I hope that after you've made that good confession, you jotted down, listening to the Holy Spirit, one or two very specific things that the Lord taught you. Bless me, Father, I've sinned. I, I, um, I've, uh, I, I've fallen, in, I've fallen um, into the um, sin of... Uh, come on. Uh, 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 impurity. Okay, very good. All right. Now, penance, absolution, and wait for something else. Oh, Holy Spirit, is there anything concrete you wish for me to do to make a change in that habit and in that sin? I'm expecting something coming in from Latin, that special Holy Ghost voice sort of soft, mildly effeminate. Oh, my son. <laughs> no, probably something like that. Don't ever look at your cell phone or your computer after 9 p.m. Now, there's a resolution that you can make. Very concrete, very boring. And I know, men, it has saved their souls. But back to that monthly thing. 
you went to confession in early October. The Holy Spirit inspired you to make a resolution, and now here comes November. Time to go back to confession. You don't feel inspired to do it. You're certainly not excited to do it. But that boring, boring priest at Rediscover said stability. And now, in the first of November, you go back to confession. And you go back to the Lord and to that priest, and you consider what has happened since you went last, when you confessed impurity, when you were forgiven for impurity, and the Holy Spirit gave you one concrete step. And now we're cooking. Now you can say, this past month I did pretty well, but I did fall a couple of times. Hallelujah. Now as you receive absolution, now as you move forward into an equally boring month, and when you come back in December, now you can chart your progress, slow as it is. I get so angry inside the confessional. You should see the holes in the wall that I punch. It happens because a man comes and does two things. He comes back and confesses that he's actually making some spiritual progress, but it hasn't been perfect, and now he feels like giving up. I want to punch that wall because I can't punch the devil and I shouldn't punch him, but he has just fallen into the trap. And this is why I have said to countless men coming to confession, and those of you who know me know how boring I am. I count. I don't have a life. I just count things. I've heard 35,672 confessions. Shouldn't I be worried about something else? But I'm not ashamed of telling you that over and over and over again, when a man finally starts to go to confession once a month, at the beginning of the month, he can see it on his calendar. He doesn't need the Holy Ghost to come down and inspire him. It's that time to go back. And he has taken note with some simple resolutions from the last time he went. And when he comes back and says to the priest, I fell into impurity three times. And just when the devil is just chuckling with delight, but he says, I fell those three times and I confess that and I am sorry for that, but last month I fell 23 times. And that, that is the glory of such a simple and boring resolution to go to confession once a month. I want to talk about once a week now. As I said, you're going home tonight, and you're not just going home tonight, you're going home into the Lord's Day. And my goal is there have been at least some people who have heard me speak about the Lord's Day so often that the yawns are breaking out all over this auditorium. And I don't care. Because once again, of those thousands of confessions and in the many, many times where I have said to a man, in light of what you're confessing, your life is just a mess, running around, all sorts of things, lots of good things perhaps, things with the family, things at work, but all sorts of sins that come up when your life is out of sync, moral impurity, becoming short with the wife and the kids, no prayer, honestly. I will say to those men, what do you do on Sundays? They're like, what? You know, this is like the expert advice I come to you for? And I say, yes.
And I go back and I quote St. John Paul II, who put together 100 pages about the Lord's Day. He said it's for three things. It's for the worship of God, yes. It's for rest, yes. It's for works of mercy. Hmm, there's an interesting one. To call your father-in-law who's sick. To get in touch with someone who could use a little bit of care. But here's my main point. The devil has convinced us that the Lord's Day is a hundred things. Time to get all the work done we couldn't squeeze into our ridiculously disorganized and disordered six days before. That we not only want, but we need, we need to watch three NFL games in a row. Life will be shattered. And yes, I say this on a weekend. <laughs> in which there's no Packer game tomorrow, and hallelujah, no Viking game either. <laughs> My goal is that tonight and tomorrow on the Lord's Day, you would have a perfectly boring time. You would waste time with your wife and children. Again, the Mormons. Lots of weird religion there but they've got a few things right, including the fact that every Monday night is family night and they are not allowed to take jobs that keep them away on Monday night. They are not allowed to have any commitments that would keep them. Oh, if only we Catholics were as committed to wasting time with God, with our spouses, our children on Sundays. Try to have yourself a boring little Lord's Day and watch how refreshed you are on Monday. We don't have time to talk about the daily habits of prayer, but oh, I hope you know that the devil wants to rob the beginning of our day and the end of our day. That's where the spiritual warfare happens. A lot of anxiety and discouragement at the start, a lot of lust and self-indulgence at the end. Put that computer down at the end. Crawl out of your bed at the beginning if you have to kneel on your knees and say that one dry as dust Hail Mary, but give your morning and your night back to God. The devil knows that. If God can capture the beginning of your day and the end of your day, no matter what happens in between, you've got what it takes. My brothers, let's get boring and let's get real. For most of us, the resolutions that we need to make are not cosmic are not about reading another religious book. It is about what we do every day and every week and every month. And I don't guarantee much, but I guarantee that if I were to see you in a year when you would do these most simple and most profound resolutions, you will be a different man you will be a strong Catholic man. Not perfect, but strong. Men, now is the time for resolution. Thank you and God bless you.